Again, I must warn against any reductionism in what I say. I do not belittle the passion, the sincerity, the dedication to the, to the liberation of the continent from those leaders. A struggle to wrest the continent from external control, diligently pursued by a number of them. I do not belittle the ideological determination of a handful, the will to transform, to catch up with the rest of the world, and redress the history of enslavement, both by the Eastern and the Western worlds. The humiliating racism for which we are on the receiving end, even till today. I do not for a moment underestimate the self-sacrificial efforts, and I do not ignore the vision of a few of those leaders. I do insist, however, that that protocol of sacrosanctity of colonial boundaries was a self-serving power mechanism of internal control and domination that had nothing to do with a structured programmatic concern for the welfare of the African masses, who after all bore the brunt of the effects of colonialism and its later camouflage successors, including internal colonialism. And thus I continue to ask have we been had? Are we still being well and truly had? Do we continue to lay ourselves wide open to be cheaply had? Well then, consider the state of the world at that very time when that conference, last year's conference in Tanzania was holding, just last October. Let's take a look over the wall, over the continental wall and instruct ourselves. That conference was taking place 60 years of modernity, after our own experience, after our independence, to taking place simultaneously with an ongoing upheaval in a distant continent, Europe, in a former colonial power, Spain. Yes, that power, Spain, was embroiled in a secessionist move by a province known as Catalonia. The initial dramatic proclamation took place in Catalonia's own provincial parliament earlier that year, echoing that other allegedly retrogressive move thousands of miles away on this very continent, in this very nation, in a region abutting the Bay of Biafra. That is, history was being replayed a full 60 years after the precedent that was set in the Bay of Biafra. In between, of course, need I remind you, there was the dismantling of the monolith known as the Republic of Soviet Union with the nearly forgotten acronym USSR. In Spain, there has been no civil war. They'd had one before, they learned their lesson also. Hindsight or foresight, irrespective of what triggers of recollection, it is all part of our humanity to call history to account from time to time. And most especially in those moments when its observed fault lines are exposed through one means or the other. And so we proceed to an even closer scenario, closer that is, even intertwined with our own history as former colonials. I refer, of course, to the United Kingdom, a fellow Commonwealth nation. I refer to the attempted breakup of that once colonial power, whose policies in the first place suddenly contributed to a violent, devastating resolution on the Nigerian testing ground. The Brexit movement is taking place within a loose organization, so we're not going there. We can claim that that's not quite the same as that ugly word, secession. However, Brexit did lead with remorseless logic 
to a renewal, repeat, renewal of the cause for Scottish independence. It's a recurrent agitation that actually resulted once in a referendum. This was in 2014, just six years ago, after a motion in the Scottish Parliament. That motion, like Brexit, obtained the assent of the Union government in Westminster. The UK government under David Cameron found it had to campaign hard to swing the vote for a no. Some here may recall that uh, even lawn tennis uh, came into it because it was close to the, um, to the Olympics. And then the anxiety became, would Andy Murray play for Scotland or would he play for the United Kingdom? I wish serious issues of national being could be considered through such a casual prism as a game of lawn tennis. I actually had the pleasure at that time of addressing another conference in the very uh, Scottish House of Parliament within the structure there. It's a conference on European Enlightenment, but it was taking place in the venue. And I had the great pleasure of mocking the parliamentarians whom I met and saying, too bad you should have learned your lesson from Biafra in Nigeria. Close our home, of course, we've undergone the breakup of Ethiopia and Eritrea after decades of human wastage. And there is, of course, to recall also the resolution of a Sudanese separatist uprising. It ended in negotiations, a negotiated divorce. When, if at all, will a verdict be objectively delivered on whether that was a, a giant step forward for humanity or one harrowing step for, for socio-political retrogression? What matters for those of us committed to a humanist way of thinking and regarding the world and ourselves is this. A direction was finally agreed upon in favor of the survival of Sudanese humanity and the annulment of the unwritten pacts of mutual human decimation. Let my comments during um, a eulogy that I delivered on home ground uh, during the funeral of the secessionist leader Odumego Juku, who was once violently excoriated, later absorbed after his military defeat into the bosom of a united uh, family. Let those comments stand for some of the wider implications that derive, not from all necessarily, but indisputably from some of such events of dubious association, even of the most benign. My comments, just a short extract, when thus. On that day, May 30th of the year 1967, a young bearded man, 34 years of age, in a fledgling nation that was barely seven years old, plunged that nation into hitherto uncharted waters and inserted a battalion of question marks on the presumptions of nation being or on more levels than one. That declaration was not merely historic. It rewrote the more familiar trajectories of colonialism, even as it implicitly served notice on the sacrosanct order of imperial givens. It moved the unarticulated question, when is the nation away from simplistic political parameters away from mere nomenclature and habit to the more critical arena of morality and internal obligations. It served notice on the conscience of the world, ripped apart the hollow claims of inheritance and replaced them with the hitherto subordinate yet logical assertiveness of a people's will. Young and old, the literate and the uneducated, urban sophisticates and rural dwellers, civilian and soldiers, all were compelled 
to re-examine their own situation in a world of close internal relations and distant ideological blocks, bringing many back to that basic question, just when is a nation? Throughout world history, many have died for, but without an awareness of the existential centrality of that question. The Biafran Act of Secession was one that could claim that people had a direct intimacy with the negative corollary of that question. The brutal, causative circumstances, I refer to the genocidal um, uh, actions, could provide only one answer to the obverse of our question, which would then read, when is a nation not? In so doing, he challenged the pietisms of former colonial masters and the sanctimoniousness of much of the world. He challenged questionable construct of nationhood, mostly externally imposed, and sought to replace it under the most harrowing circumstances with a vital proposition that answered a desired goal of humanity, which is not merely to survive, but to live in dignity. Even today, many will admit that in this same nation, the question remains unresolved. That more and more voices are probing that question, just when is a nation? From Central Africa, through India, Pakistan, to Myanmar and the Soviet Union, inquire of Chechnya, for instance, and the siege of Beslan that wasted nearly 300 young lives. Innumerable are the casualties from contestations of that facile and unreflective proposition that whatever is, is immutably ordered, which confers the mantle of divine ordinance on those special contrivances called nations, even as they continue to creak at the seams and consume human lives in their millions. Such arch conservationists, sometimes admittedly imbued with a high sense of mission, see only a sacrosanct order in what was never accorded human approbation, as if it is not the very human occupancy that confers reality and vitality on any inert piece of real estate. Julius Nyerere was too astute not to know that his gesture of recognition was futile. That leaves us one extract, arguably others, but I wish to fasten on just one, symbolic. Translated into the language of propulsive thinking, impelled to extract a lesson from an unrelenting cycle of human wastage. That lesson would read, humanity before nation. Indeed, Nyerere's justification of his action implied as much, it said as much. And when we finally met, we did, after his retirement, during a North-South conference in Lisbon, we talked, we discussed the war, and it was during, still at the height of the uh, anti-apartheid uh, struggle. He reaffirmed the rationale behind his decision. Well, it does not matter, he was a politician. It doesn't matter whether or not that alone constituted the entire rationale for his choice. What does matter for us today is the imperative of a revisionist attitude, even as a purely academic exercise. For example, ask ourselves questions such as, what price territorial integrity, where the physical territory plus the humanity that justify, that work, that territory can be signed away as a pact between two leaders, as did happen between Nigeria and Cameroon. You seek an answer to that? Well, go and ask the fluctuating refugees on the Bakasi region. 
ask them just what is the meaning for them of territorial integrity. Again, I feel obliged to emphasize that this has nothing to do with whether or not one side was in the wrong or right, nothing to do with accusing a lack of vision of pandering to or resisting the wiles and calculations of erstwhile colonial rulers, or indeed taking sides in a Cold War that existed at the time, a Cold War that turned Africans into surrogate players and the continent into prostrate testing ground for new weaponry. No, we merely place before ourselves an exercise in hindsight with no intention, however, of denying credit to those who did exercise foresight at the time. We propose simply that the loss of two million and a half people, the maiming and traumatization of innumerable others, and devastation on a vital, uh, vital, unimaginative scale by a nation turned against itself, even as it teetered on the edge of modernity, provokes sober reflection. That's all. Sober reflection. A rethinking that is unafraid, especially since such scenarios considered in some cases even more brutish have since followed on this continent. Need one recall Rwanda's own uh, entry into the contest in morbid pathology, one that surpasses even the Biafran carnage when comparatively assessed in duration and population parameters. All remain active reminders to haunt Africa's collective conscience, the existence of which I know is an optimistic presumption, but it appears to elude the ministrations of politicians and or ideologues, and indeed sometimes theologians. I propose, therefore, that we borrow a leaf from our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Such is the ingrained slave mentality of the progeny of those dispersed people on this soil, the people they left behind, that is, we. That uh, this progeny, sometimes uh, those who sold them into slavery in the first place, that they sometimes consider it a duty, even honor, to take up cudgels on behalf of the denigrators of our own kind, those who call us shithole countries, those who denigrate our own race. They then, our own people, proceed to insult those who react in their own personal way to such racists, however powerfully positioned and no matter where on the globe they control millions of people. So let me jog your memories regarding the spate of serial killings. It took place in America just about that time when a certain president was haranguing his way on the back of the insults of African nations into the presidency of the White House. The African Americans, tired of being arbitrary, sacrificial lambs, went on nationwide protest matches carrying placards that read Black Lives Matter. So adopting that simple exhortation enables us to include the millions of victims of failed or indifferent leadership who are more concerned with power and its rewards, who see the nation not as expressions of a people's will, a people's need, sense of belonging and industry, but as pawns in which they, the bullfrogs of our time, can exercise power for its own sake. It is they who militate against the reality of nation, not, and I shall end on a selective note, not, for instance, the products of migration 
from purely nominal nation enclaves on this continent. Those who perish daily along the Sahara Desert routes, who drown in droves in the Mediterranean, they are the ones who confronted themselves with the question and an answer resulted in a rather terminal determinism. When is the nation was the question they asked themselves. And unfortunately, they answered not when we left, where we thought whom. As long as our humanity opts for unmarked graves in the Sahara Desert or in the stomachs of fishes in the Mediterranean, their answer remains to haunt all of us. Yes, indeed. Let us internalize that African-American declaration as a statement of living faith, an expression of our humanity that may compel leadership to pause at crucial moments of decision, thereby earn us a space where we can rethink those bequeathed absolutes that we so proudly spout, gospels of sacrosanctity, imperatives of or even questionable truths about nationhood that nerve us to advance so conceitedly towards the dehumanization and decimation of our own kind. Any time that leadership on whichever side is about to repeat yet again the ultimate folly of sacrificing two and a half million lives on the altar of absolutes, any absolute whatsoever, we should borrow that African-American credo, paint them on prayer scrolls, flood the skies in their millions with kites bearing that inscription, and balloons that read very simply, African lives matter. Thank you very much. Thank you.